Hidden among the ranches and rolling hills in the northern part of Denton County, Texas, the remains of more than 400 people lie in an overgrown cemetery. And even though it was abandoned and forgotten a long time ago, a few headstones can still be found. But most of the graves in this place never had a marker to begin with. That's because the people who were buried in them were considered to be property, not much different than a horse or a mule. This is where slaves were buried. Hello, my name is Marcus Lloyd. And I'm Michelle Renee. We thank you for joining us. If you are African American, you and I will always be connected to the people whose bodies lie in that cemetery. Our ancestors may have worked alongside of them in the same cotton fields. They could have been bought and sold at the same auction houses or had chains hammered around their necks by the same overseer. Some of them may have even been hunted down by the same slave catcher or whipped by the same master. For almost 250 years, our people were held in bondage. And today, this period of history has come to be known by an ancient Swahili word. It's called the Ma'afa. And it began when the first Africans were shackled to the bottom of a slave ship. But the irony is that it did not end when the slaves were freed. In fact, it hasn't ended yet. And as you're about to see, a hidden racial agenda is keeping the Ma'afa alive into the 21st century. What shall be done with the four million slaves if they are emancipated? This question has been answered and can be answered in many ways. Primarily, it is a question less for man than for God, less for human intellect than for the laws of nature to solve. Our answer is, do nothing with them. Mind your business and let them mind theirs. Your doing with them is their greatest misfortune. They have been undone by your doings and all they now ask and really have need of at your hands is just to let them alone. Frederick Douglass, 1862. It is the stupidity of man to think that he can do evil, even some monstrous evil, and it won't have any backlash on himself. But of course, it seldom works that way. And the moment he figures that out, he starts looking for a way to avoid the repercussions of what he's done. This is what happened with slavery. In the early 1800s, as it began to look like the end of slavery might be on the horizon, white America started to be concerned that a day of reckoning was coming. The primary fear for the average person was of retribution and insurrection, and that was a reasonable fear. After all, it's illogical to think that you can do to a whole group of people what was done to African Americans and think that they will just take it lying down forever. And of course, there were things like the Nat Turner uprisings. But for the wealthy elite, their fears went beyond things like insurrection. They were worried about the financial impact. Remember. It was not just the cotton plantations that profited from slavery. Whether you're talking about the banks uh, or the insurance companies, uh, the railroads, even the newspapers, the fact is that almost every aspect of the American economy was at some level or another invested in the slave business. You also need to recognize that for the wealthy elitist who controlled this system, slaves were an asset as long as they were slaves. But at the moment they are set free, they become a liability. And what the elite knew was that the end of slavery would instantly release four million people into the economy who had been kept uneducated and effectively unemployable anywhere but the cotton field. And what they were concerned about was that this was gonna bankrupt the American economy. Taxes were gonna go through the roof to take care of these people. Crime was gonna be rampant. The prisons were gonna be flooded. There was going to be this population overrun. And in the North, the biggest fear was migration from the South of these black people. The other fear that these people had was intermarriage between blacks and whites would lead to a loss of racial purity. The question was, what were they going to do about it? And their initial thought was that they would just send all the slaves back to Africa. This plan was called colonization, and it had broad support among the wealthy elite. In fact, the American Colonization Society was even funded by the United States Congress. 
But in the end, colonization proved to be unworkable and the idea was eventually scrapped. But about that same time, a new philosophy was emerging in the world. It was called eugenics. And for some, it seemed like the perfect solution to, had, to what had become known as the Negro Dilemma. I do not join in the belief that the African is our equal in brain or in heart. And I believe that if we can, in any fair way, possess ourselves of his services, we have an equal right to utilize them to our advantage. Francis Galton, 1857. Francis Galton is known as the father of eugenics. He actually coined the phrase eugenics. So he believed in trying to increase those he felt were superior in stock and decrease those he felt were inferior. Francis Galton came from a very wealthy family, a family that made its wealth from the slave trade. And what a lot of people don't know is that Francis Galton was a cousin to Charles Darwin. Francis Galton took Charles Darwin's philosophies and ideas and thoughts and he actually put them into practice and that's what we know today as eugenics. Eugenics and evolution are related in that they both see what they consider to be the um, highest form of primate, such as the gorilla, as almost indistinguishable from what they consider the lowest form of human, the African and the Aborigine. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state, and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Charles Darwin, 1890. Charles Darwin is very well known for writing uh, The Origin of Species in the 1800s. This book gave rise to evolutionary theory. What people don't know is that there was actually uh, a longer original title to this book, and that was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, uh, copies and editions that they made afterwards eliminated that phrase about the favored races. Evidently, they understood then that it was politically incorrect. Some may defend Francis Galton because eventually that he rejected slavery, but uh, they do point out that all of his wealth did derive from the slave trade, but also it needs to be known that he, as well as other eugenists, did not reject slavery until after it had ended and they could not any longer exploit blacks legally. So at that point, it would have been quite easy for he and uh, his cohorts to uh, reject slavery. Well, I think this is a point that we all have to really realize that the eugenics movement was not uh, invented by the everyday average uh, white American, but by a select group of wealthy, white elitists that had often uh, used uh, this ideology to pit all of white America against black America. And so we see that indeed that truly is the case even to this day. Average Negroes possess too little intellect, self-reliance, and self-control to make it possible for them to sustain the burden of any respectable form of civilization without a large measure of external guidance and support. Francis Galton, 1873. Eugenicists believed that Africans were inferior not just mentally, but physically, and that left to themselves, left alone, they would not make it. The problem is, it didn't work. With that failure, the eugenicists moved on to what is known as positive eugenics. In positive eugenics, the eugenicists wanted the white population to reproduce, to have so many children that it overwhelmed the black population. But that didn't work either. Next, they moved on to what they called negative eugenics. They knew that they could not round up all the blacks in the nation and execute them, so they decided to create an environment where they would convince the blacks to severely limit the number of children they were going to have and thereby commit race suicide.
The problem of the socially fit must be treated not as one of color, but as a problem of the spread of feeble-mindedness. Dr. Charles Davenport, 1913, director of the Eugenics Record Office, Cold Spring Harbor, New York, and co-founder of the American Eugenics Society. The eugenics realized that they could not uh, promote their agenda simply because they knew it would be viewed as politically incorrect and socially unacceptable. So what they did was use code words that were once successful in slavery, terms such as feeble-minded, uh, unfit, uh, words such as imbecile, immoral, criminal, they uh, tag those labels upon the targeted community. Uh, these words were less inflammatory, so it, get, it lets society more or less not be totally alarmed of the original intent, but deep down inside, I believe everyone truly knew what segment of society and what people they were actually uh, talking about. Even a cursory glance at the charts, photographs, and diagrams used to popularize eugenic ideals reveals that the unfit were swarthy, black, and ugly by Anglo-Saxon standards with flattened noses, wiry hair, and prognathous profiles. Harriet Washington, author, Medical Apartheid. In the early 20th century, the white elitists who made up the eugenics movement were no longer just philosophers and academics. Now they were industrialists and billionaires who had come to embrace a worldview that was essentially identical to the eugenics movement. The same individuals and corporations who had once made millions on the backs of slaves were now willing to spend millions to get rid of them. But that didn't mean that these guys were interested in being public crusaders for the eugenics movement. They were certainly willing to be the brains and the money behind it, but they would hire crusaders to do the dirty work. And the primary one they settled upon was a woman named Margaret Sanger. She was the founder of the American Birth Control League and the publisher of its newsletter, The Birth Control Review. On a practical level, the relationship between Sanger and these elitists was uh, basically a marriage of convenience. In order to advance their common agendas, they needed a front man and she needed money. And the whole thing would be held together by this kind of bizarre obsession with race and class. The result was that the American Birth Control League became the driving force behind the American eugenics movement. Eugenics would no longer just be a philosophy. Sanger and others like her were gonna put it into practice. We are paying for and even submitting to the dictates of an ever increasing, unceasingly spawning class of human beings who never should have been born at all. Margaret Sanger, 1922. The laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit, and human life is valuable only when it is of use to the community or race. Madison Grant, 1916, co-founder, American Eugenics Society. The black man has never been a competitor, but has always been subservient to the white race. And just so long as he remains subservient, his position is secure. And just so soon as he becomes a competitor, his fate is sealed. Dr. Benjamin Hayes, eugenicist, 1905. The American Birth Control League was wise enough to get their program of population control across by using what had worked in the past, the same code words that had established the institution of slavery and that was also used by the early eugenics movement was once again used by the American Birth Control League. The Margaret Sangers of those days did not come out and say they were trying to eliminate black people. What they did say, they were trying to rid society of the feeble-minded. They were trying to rid the society of the criminal. Well, she was successful simply because of her eugenics friends for the past 50 years had uh, put those labels on minorities and African Americans and therefore society was more or less desensitized. In effect, the code words hid the agenda of Margaret Sanger and the eugenist. At that time, they did uh, shift over to the, what they called the quality of life. Uh, it was a philosophy unquestionably used to target the poor simply because what the quality of life 
at its core meaning was that poor people really didn't have a reason to live. Only uh, the white, those with status, had any chance of a meaningful or purposeful life. Uh, the solution for the poor now was not to eliminate the circumstances that would cause poverty. Their solution now was to eliminate the poor, eliminate the impoverished, and just wipe them off the face of the earth. The practice of birth control among the majority of colored people would probably be more eugenic than among their white compatriots. The dissemination of the information of birth control should have begun with this class, rather than with the upper social and economic classes of white citizens. Walter Turpening, Birth Control Review, 1932. In virtually every community where Negroes dwell, one finds them in fat times and lean alike, contributing a disproportionate number to the roles of the dependents and delinquents. They make excessive demands on the white man's charity and overtax his patients. Newell Sims, Birth Control Review, 1932. Author Madison Grant was a co-founder of the American Eugenics Society and an officer of the New York Zoological Society. In 1906, he had authorized an exhibit at the Bronx Zoo in which a 22-year-old African named Oda Benga was displayed in a cage in the monkey house. Sharing the cage with Benga was an orangutan. When a local clergyman protested the exhibit, he said that it was clearly intended to be a demonstration of Darwin's theory of evolution. Local proponents of Darwinism apparently agreed and labeled the display educational. Ten years after this event, Oda Benga committed suicide. During Hitler's regime, the Germans were supplied with elaborate charts and complicated theses supposedly proving the superiority of the German people. It is interesting to note that at the bottom of these charts were the colored people of the world, most conspicuously, the black people. Floyd McKissick, National Director, Congress of Racial Equality, 1967. An often overlooked fact about the German Holocaust is that the Nazis did not simply target the Jewish population. They went after the black community as well. Under the threat of being sent to concentration camps if they did not cooperate, Afro-German citizens were not only forced to undergo sterilization themselves, they were also required to turn over their children for sterilization. In his book, Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler explained the motivation behind such programs. The Jews were responsible for bringing Negroes into the Rhineland. It suits the purpose of the cool, calculating Jew who would use this means of introducing a process of bastardization in the very center of the European continent and, by infecting the white race with the blood of an inferior stock, would destroy the foundations of its independent existence. Adolf Hitler, Mein Kampf. The Nazi attitude toward blacks was clearly defined in a 1944 book by Robert Ley, who was the head of the German labor front. Ley characterized the Jewish race as a disease-riddled parasite that had been created by unnatural inbreeding between white men and the racially inferior Negro. He described the result as a racial swamp that would eventually destroy the natural superiority of the Aryan race. Another Nazi publication described blacks as African brutes who had not been tamed even by centuries of slavery. It went on to say that any effort to assimilate people of African descent into civilized society was a waste of time and that the lynchings of blacks in America did not merit any regret. Since World War II, it has been well documented that Adolf Hitler was profoundly influenced by the American eugenics movement, and that many of his government's racial policies were actually developed from the writings of American eugenicists, like Madison Grant and Harry Laughlin. In fact, Hitler referred to Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race, as his Bible. Meanwhile, American eugenicists were routinely praising Hitler and holding up the Nazi eugenics program as a model for the United States to copy. The leader of the German nation, Adolf Hitler, 
has been able to construct a comprehensive racial policy of population development and improvement. The difference between the Jew and the Aryan is as unsurmountable as that between black and white. Germany has set a pattern which other nations must follow. Dr. Clarence Gordon Campbell, 1935, President, Eugenics Research Association, New York. Among those American eugenicists who most strongly supported the Nazis was a member of the American Eugenics Society, a director of the American Birth Control League and a writer for the Birth Control Review. His name was Lothrop Stoddard. As an avowed racist, Stoddard was the author of a book called The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy, which was widely promoted by the Ku Klux Klan. In another book, The Dragon and the Cross, Stoddard was identified as the exalted Cyclops of the Massachusetts chapter of the Klan. Non-white races must be excluded from America. The red and black races, if left to themselves, revert to a savage or semi-savage state in a short time. Lothrop Stoddard, Director, American Birth Control League. On the 19th of December, 1939, during a four-month stay in Germany, Stoddard was given a personal meeting with both Adolf Hitler and the man who would eventually be in charge of the Nazi Holocaust, SS leader Heinrich Himmler. Later, when a course on race was introduced at Halle University in Germany, its instructor stated that it would be modeled on the philosophies of American eugenicists, including Lothrop Stoddard. Eventually, Stoddard's racial views would even be featured in Nazi school textbooks. The white race divides into three main subspecies, the Nordics, the Alpines, and the Mediterraneans. All three are good stocks, ranking in genetic worth well above the various colored races. Lothrop Stoddard, Director, American Birth Control League. To eliminate blacks from Germany, one of the people Hitler called on was a eugenicist who had once written that blacks are an inferior race of savages who should only be allowed to survive as long as they are of use to the Aryan race. His name was Eugen Fischer. And about 20 years earlier, he had been one of the leaders of a system of concentration camps in southwestern Africa, where blacks were rounded up to be executed, experimented on, or held as free labor. Under Hitler, Fischer would serve on committees that planned the sterilization of all blacks in countries that came under German control. He would also be one of the first Nazi scientists to become publicly affiliated with the Carnegie-funded Eugenics Laboratory in Cold Spring Harbor, New York. Eventually, Fischer would also be put in charge of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, which was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. It was here that many of the Nazi programs for creating racial purity were developed. In 1927, Margaret Sanger organized the World Population Conference in Geneva, Switzerland, and gave it front page coverage in her birth control review. The events program shows that several of its attendees were colleagues of Sanger's from the American eugenics movement. It also documents that among those who were given a leadership role in the conference was Eugen Fischer, the man who would eventually lead the Nazi effort to eradicate blacks from Europe. Another American eugenicist with Nazi connections was Harry Laughlin. Now, he was an official with both the American Eugenics Society and the American Birth Control League. And in 1928, his plan for using forced sterilization to eliminate those who might produce what he called degenerate offspring was published in the Birth Control Review. In 1936, Laughlin led an effort to distribute the English language version of a Nazi eugenics film to audiences in the northeastern part of the United States. He had acquired the rights to the film from the Race Policy Office of the Nazi Party and, with the help of two other American eugenics organizations, had mailed literature to biology teachers at 3,000 U.S. high schools, urging them to show it in their classrooms. Later that year, Laughlin was praised in a Nazi newspaper and awarded an honorary degree from the University of Heidelberg for his contributions to the Nazi eugenics effort. In the 1930s, a German psychiatrist named Ernst Rudin was named president of the International Federation of Eugenics in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, which was funded by the Carnegie Corporation. 
1933, his call for racial purity was published in the Birth Control Review. Later, Rudin would be chosen by Hitler to write Germany's eugenics laws. And at one point, he personally helped the Gestapo round up and sterilize several hundred blacks, who they referred to as Rhineland bastards. After the war, Rudin would be identified as one of the architects of the barbaric medical experiments that the Nazis carried out in their concentration camps. It may be possible that Hitler actually got the idea for concentration camps while studying the American eugenics movement. In 1919, the state of Indiana had allocated $300,000 to create a work colony in the city of Butlerville, where those who were labeled feeble-minded would be incarcerated. Then in 1932, Margaret Sanger called for the United States government to set aside farms and open spaces where certain groups of people would be segregated from the rest of society. She proposed that, among others, the illiterate, the unemployed, and the poor should be forcibly kept in these areas until they developed what she called better moral conduct. It was later discovered that under the Indiana program, the state was allowed to label someone feeble-minded if they were poor or did not do well in school or if the state considered them to be shiftless or have insufficient moral judgment. But it's important to understand that this Indiana campaign was not unlike those in other states. For example, a eugenics project conducted in Massachusetts during the late 1920s proposed sterilization for young girls who were diagnosed as defective which could include being unwed and pregnant, financially poor, or if the state labeled them socially undesirable. In addition, boys as young as 14 could be castrated for showing signs of kleptomania or for exhibiting what was described as solitary behavior. In a single incident during 1935, the Nazis sterilized the children of over 600 German women because it was reported that those children had been fathered by black men. When news of this reached the United States, a member of the American Eugenics Society named Walter Ashby Plecker wrote a letter to the German Bureau of Human Betterment and Eugenics, praising them for the action and expressing his hope that not one child had been missed. Ten years earlier, Plecker had written that the black population was the greatest problem and most destructive force which confronts the white race and American civilization. Eugenics goals are most likely attained under a name other than eugenics. Frederick Osborne, president and founding member of the American Eugenics Society. By the late 1930s and early 1940s, Revelations about Nazi and fascist atrocities in Europe were causing the public to become increasingly uncomfortable with terms like eugenics and population control. This alarmed the leaders of the American Birth Control League, who were aware that this shifting attitude could impact both their ability to implement their racial agenda and their ability to raise funds. They were also aware that the connections between the American Birth Control League and the Nazis were starting to become known. Marketing research had shown them that in this environment, they needed to move away from words like control in favor of less threatening words like planning. So in 1942, they changed the name of the organization. From then on, the American Birth Control League would officially be known as Planned Parenthood. The important thing to understand here is that this name change did not change the organization's agenda. The same people were still in control, they were still obsessed with race, and they were still dedicated to eugenics. Today, defenders of Margaret Sanger will often try to hide her racism by claiming that she was not really a eugenicist and that Planned Parenthood was never part of the eugenics movement. But the truth is that as late as 1956, the American Eugenics Society listed Sanger as a member of the organization. In addition, many of Sanger's colleagues and the people whose writings she published, as well as many of Planned Parenthood's officers, were also known to be members. In fact, the ties between Sanger and the eugenics movement were so well established 
that in the 1920s, Sanger pursued a plan to merge the American Birth Control League, or Planned Parenthood, as it was later called, with the American Eugenic Society. However, despite Sanger's efforts, the merger plan died after being rejected by the leadership of the American Eugenic Society. As an alternative, Sanger then proposed that the two organizations at least combine their publications into one magazine. But again, that idea was also rejected by the American Eugenic Society. The eugenic and civilization value of birth control is becoming apparent to the enlightened and the intelligent. The campaign for birth control is not merely of eugenic value, but is practically identical in ideal with the final aim of eugenics. Margaret Sanger, 1921. In her autobiography, Margaret Sanger wrote about a speech she gave in 1926 at a Ku Klux Klan rally in Silver Lake, New Jersey. The Planned Parenthood founder bragged about the fact that afterward, she was invited by 12 other Klan chapters to speak at their events. At about the same time the American Birth Control League was changing its name to Planned Parenthood, a lot of books and reports began coming out that attempted to put a happy face on eugenics. And many of them were written by people that were associated with Planned Parenthood. The strategy here was obvious. Since the Nazis had turned eugenics into a four-letter word, the American eugenics movement decided it was time to lay low. So most of their writings during this time period downplayed the role of eugenics and couched their agenda in terms of helping the African American. Perhaps the best example of this is a 1500 page book by eugenicist Gunnar Myrdal called An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem in Modern Democracy. Interestingly, this book was not the result of some mom and pop operation. Myrdal had 75 assistants working on this project whose salaries were being paid for by the Carnegie Corporation. And Carnegie had been a major player in the eugenics movement for many years. Gunnar Myrdal and his wife Alva were both involved in eugenics. They were funded by both the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation. They were also closely linked to a Swedish eugenics program which forcibly sterilized 66,000 people. When you read chapter seven of this book, it becomes undeniable that this is a blueprint for the modern eugenics movement that we still see in the United States today. The bottom line is that Gunnar Murdahl believed that not only could blacks not help themselves, he felt that nobody could help them, and the only solution in his eyes was to get rid of them. Commonly, it is considered a great misfortune for America that Negro slaves were ever imported. The presence of Negroes in America today is usually considered a plight of the nation. Chapter 7, page 167. All white Americans agree that if the Negro is to be eliminated, he must be eliminated slowly, so as not to hurt any living individual Negroes. Chapter 7, page 168. The only way possible of decreasing Negro population is by means of controlling fertility. Chapter 7, page 170. Birth control facilities could be extended relatively more to Negroes than to whites, since Negroes are more concentrated in the lower income and education classes. Chapter 7, page 176. One thing I find very revealing about Chapter 7 is the first paragraph. Murdahl uses U.S. Census Bureau figures to show that between 1790 and 1940, the black population in the United States increased 17 times. At the same time, those Census Bureau figures show that the white population increased 37 times. However, neither Murdahl nor any other eugenicist wrote anything about what to do about that part of the population that was increasing twice as fast as the black population. Gunnar Murdahl's book on how to resolve what he called the Negro problem was published in 1944 by Harper and Brothers of New York. Four years earlier, the same company, which is today known as Harper Collins, had also published a book by one of the founding members of the American Eugenic Society. At the time that Harper and Brothers published these books, its president was a man named Cass Canfield, who would later become 
the national president of Planned Parenthood. We hope that the restraint of population growth can come about through voluntary means. But if it does not, involuntary methods will be used. Dr. Donald Minkler, 1972. Donald Minkler was the president of the American Association of Planned Parenthood Physicians and a member of the board of directors of Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Like many of those in the eugenics movement, he understood that their plans would not always be voluntarily adopted and that the use of governmental coercion or even force might one day be necessary. The idea of forced eugenics was not something that suddenly developed in the 1970s. In a 1929 speech, American eugenicist Samuel Holmes had proposed that mandatory birth control should be used as a tool to eliminate what he called the menace to the white race that had been created by increases in black population. His solution was to have a quota system in which the right to have a child would be controlled by the government and determined by race. At the time, Holmes was on the National Council of the American Birth Control League, which would later become known as Planned Parenthood. Then in 1936, eugenicist Julian Huxley proposed that the genetically inferior classes could be made to have fewer children if they were denied easy access to welfare. Another part of this proposal was that medical care to these same people should be restricted in order to reduce the survival rates of the children they did have. He also called for the forced sterilization of anyone who was unemployed beyond a certain length of time. Huxley was later honored by Planned Parenthood and was a featured speaker at one of their annual conventions. The reality is that the views of people like Samuel Holmes and Julian Huxley were never uncommon within the American eugenics community. In 1969, a professor at the University of California, Dr. Garrett Hardin, called it insanity to rely on volunteerism to control population. Hardin was a member of the American Eugenics Society and an outspoken advocate of government-enforced birth control, saying that citizens should be willing to give up their right to breed for the betterment of society. In 1980, he was given Planned Parenthood's highest national award. He and his wife would later kill themselves in a joint suicide pact. There were, of course, some within the eugenics movement who were uncomfortable with the idea of using force, and they would often express their reservations about it in public. But when pressed, virtually none of them would rule it out, including Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger. I consider that the world and almost our civilization for the next 25 years is going to depend upon a simple, cheap, safe contraceptive to be used in poverty-stricken slums, jungles, and among the most ignorant people. Even this will not be sufficient, because I believe that now, immediately, there should be national sterilization for certain dysgenic types of our population who are being encouraged to breed and would die out were the government not feeding them. Margaret Sanger, 1950. This was written by Sanger in a personal letter to Catherine Dexter McCormick, McCormick was an heir to the international harvester fortune and would later use part of her immense wealth to fund the development of the birth control pill. In 1966, an example of the coercive power of state eugenics laws was seen in Maryland when three young mothers applied for welfare benefits. All three were arrested for child neglect, even though the authorities never claimed to have any evidence of abuse or neglect. Instead, the women were held under a state law which stated that simply being unmarried and pregnant was child neglect. The judge in this case warned the women that if they ever became pregnant again, the state would take custody of all their children. Officials in Prince George's County, where the arrest took place, stated that welfare recipients could avoid being prosecuted under this law by submitting to state-sponsored birth control education. In 1934, Adolf Hitler sent a letter to American eugenicist Leon Whitney, complimenting him for a book he had written on sterilization. Whitney was the former executive secretary of the American Eugenics Society and a colleague of Margaret Sanger's. 
Sanger also published his writings in the Birth Control Review. In the book that Hitler was praising, Whitney had written that America could eliminate what he called the slum elements of society by sterilizing the lowest 25% of its population. He claimed this was necessary because such people are too stupid to understand or practice even simple methods of contraception. Besides, he said, the country would hardly miss them. One of the people he was talking about was named Elaine Riddick. At the age of 13, I became pregnant. I was raped by a guy that lived across the street from me. He snatched me off the street and molested me and threatened my life and said if I ever told anyone that he would kill me. When they was delivering my son, they sterilized me at the same time. They had approached my grandmother and said that if she wanted to continue to receive supplement, welfare and food stamps, or um, at this time it was given out these uh, surplus foods, canned cheese, I think it was, uh, powdered eggs, and said that if she did not sign the X, that they were gonna stop her supplements. Mind you, my grandmother, was illiterate. She had never, ever gone to school. She didn't understand what it was. So she signed the acts, and they did this to me. I did not find out that they had sterilized me until I was 19 years old. I asked the state of North Carolina why they did this to me, and they said that because I was feeble-minded that I would not be able to take care of myself, I would not be able to tie my shoes, that I was uh, just incompetent. The state of North Carolina also said that I had never performed, at the age of 13, I had never performed a day's work in my life. They couldn't get me to do anything. But at the age of 13, I mean, should not have been in, should I not have been in school? They were saying that feeble-mindedness is hereditary. So they sterilized me so I would not produce my kind. Mind you, I am not illiterate, nor am I feeble-minded. I never went into high school but yet I still acquired a college degree. They also justified that my child or my children would be feeble-minded. My son is the president of his own semiconductor company. He has his own construction company. And he has his own real estate company. I just, I mean, how can you think that your government allowed or allowing these things to happen to a person, a, a life? You don't have, you can't say nothing, you have no rights. To me, they took away all of my rights. They sterilized kids from, at the, from my understanding and my knowledge as young as eight years of age. I don't know what an eight-year-old can do that could cause them to do this to them. The only reason I can give myself is that because they're black. In 1961, social worker Sue Casebolt had been installed as the executive secretary of the North Carolina Eugenics Board. At a board meeting held three weeks later, she stated that she was going to keep a file on every child whose name reached her desk so that they could be picked up as soon as they reached childbearing age. Casebolt was still on the board in 1968 when it approved the sterilization of 14-year-old Elaine Riddick. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, 
Society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Oliver Wendell Holmes, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, 1927. Holmes made this statement in his ruling on the constitutionality of Virginia's forced sterilization law. It mirrored the views of President Theodore Roosevelt, who had originally appointed Holmes to the Supreme Court. In a 1913 letter to American Eugenic Society founder Charles Davenport, Roosevelt had stated that the country had no business allowing citizens of the wrong type to reproduce. In 1907, Indiana had become the first of more than 30 states to pass sterilization laws, and some of those laws stayed on the books well into the 1970s. In fact, the state of Oregon did its last sterilization in 1981 and did not abolish its eugenics board until October of 1983. Some states practice sterilization without ever creating an official eugenics board. In those instances, few if any records were kept. And in the states that did keep records, many have never been made available to the public. But in just those states that have released their records, it is known that at least 60,000 Americans were sterilized, and they were disproportionately black. In addition, during a 1973 lawsuit, a federal judge estimated that as many as 150,000 additional low-income women may have been sterilized under federal programs alone. These sterilizations were often performed without the patient's knowledge or consent, and sometimes against their will. It was also common for social workers to tell welfare recipients that they would lose their benefits if they did not agree to be sterilized. In some cases, Poor families were even threatened with the loss of welfare unless they brought their children in for sterilization. The result was that some of the people sterilized were as young as 10 years old. In the first six months of 1972, one hospital in Aiken County, South Carolina, sterilized over one-third of the Medicaid patients who were there to give birth, and all but one of these women were black. One patient said she was told by all three of the county's obstetricians that they would not deliver her baby unless she agreed to be sterilized. Her claim was later confirmed by each of the doctors. Another patient said she was told by one of these same physicians that he was tired of having to help support the babies of welfare recipients and that she could either agree to be sterilized or find another doctor. The law of nature says that only the fit shall survive. When a nation disregards this law by protecting the unfit and encouraging their multiplication, this nation invites inevitable destruction. As far as New Jersey is concerned, sterilization is an economic necessity. And as far as the United States is concerned, sterilization is a matter of national preservation. Fred Shepard, Assemblyman. Fred Shepard was a member of the New Jersey State Legislature. He made this statement upon his introduction of a sterilization bill in March of 1942. In some parts of the country, Planned Parenthood was closely associated with these state eugenics boards and was often a referral agency for them. But the system did not always run smoothly. In 1969, when the number of sterilizations approved by the Iowa State Eugenics Board began to drop, the board was attacked in the press by the executive director of Planned Parenthood, Robert Weber. He said that he was alarmed by the decline in numbers and that the eugenics board should expand its approval criteria. Board chairman Dr. S.M. Corson responded that the board's guidelines were already fairly broad. He pointed out that approvals were routinely given for young girls for no reason other than the board's speculation that they might likely one day engage in immoral behavior without the capacity for being wives and mothers. At that point, Weber publicly scolded the board and told them that they should either increase the number of sterilizations or quit. From its beginning, Planned Parenthood always had powerful ties to the American eugenics community. In fact, in many places, they were often one and the same. For example, when the first birth control clinic was opened in Arkansas, it was operated by the Arkansas Eugenics Association and overseen by a woman named Hilda Cornish. Later, the Arkansas Eugenics Association would become the Arkansas State Affiliate 
of Planned Parenthood, and Cornish would be named its executive director. During the four months that American Birth Control League director Lothrop Stoddard was in Nazi Germany, he not only met with Hitler and SS chief Heinrich Himmler, he also attended one of the Nazi eugenics courts. The first case I saw looked like an excellent candidate for sterilization. A man in his mid-thirties, he was rather ape-like in appearance. Receding forehead, flat nose with blaring nostrils, thick lips, and heavy prognathous jaw. Not vicious looking, but gross and rather dull. Lothrop Stoddard, director, American Birth Control League, later known as Planned Parenthood. Given the admiration that Adolf Hitler expressed for the American eugenics movement, it is not unlikely that he modeled the eugenics courts in Nazi Germany after the state eugenics boards in the US. In both countries, feeble-mindedness was routinely used as a catch-all justification for sterilization, and the diagnosis of feeble-mindedness was almost always left up to the judgment of the person advocating the sterilization. First, the white man tells me to sit in the back of the bus. Now it looks like he wants me to sleep under the bed. Back in the days of slavery, black folks couldn't grow kids fast enough for white folks to harvest. Now that we got a little taste of power, white folks wants to call a moratorium on having babies. Comedian Dick Gregory, Ebony Magazine, 1971. By the 1960s, the American eugenics movement had been reasonably successful in getting sterilization laws and prohibitions against interracial marriage passed. They also had some success in getting states to mandate sterilization for those convicted of even non-sexual crimes, and some states began to require sterilization as a condition for receiving welfare or health care. Meanwhile, another state proposed jail time for anyone who had a child out of wedlock unless they agreed to be sterilized, and at least one state required sterilization as a condition of being released from custody. But these laws were not producing the results Planned Parenthood and others in the eugenics movement wanted. They also began to fear that federal courts were going to eventually rule that these kinds of measures were unconstitutional. At about the same time, however, something new was being introduced to American society. It was called the birth control pill. And the eugenics movement quickly saw it as the perfect solution for controlling the population of people they had always seen as oversexed, unsophisticated, and lazy. But what they would eventually discover is that while the pill was enthusiastically embraced by whites, it was generally rejected by blacks, despite the fact that Planned Parenthood focused its marketing on the African American community and located the vast majority of its facilities in black neighborhoods. What Planned Parenthood and the rest of the eugenics movement did not count on was that many blacks did not want to reduce their numbers. In fact, they saw high birth rates as the most effective way to increase their power in the American political system. The other reality was that an increasing number of African Americans were becoming suspicious that a hidden agenda was behind the birth control revolution. Even those who once supported the idea of population control were beginning to sense that it actually meant black population control. This feeling was evident in June of 1970 when the Black Caucus walked out of the first National Congress on Optimum Population and Environment being held in Chicago. Felton Alexander of the National Urban League and the chairman of the Black Caucus said the action was taken because of clear and unmistakable evidence that the purpose of the conference was to legitimize the extermination of the black population. By this time, many other civil rights advocates were beginning to see the same thing. Contraceptives will become a form of drug warfare against the helpless in this nation. Jesse Jackson, 1971. There is a campaign to bombard the poor with pills and potions. If this movement continues, we soon may be accused of fighting poverty by eliminating the poor and overcoming hunger by removing the hungry. New York Congressman Hugh Carey, 1966. Under the cover of an alleged campaign to alleviate poverty, White supremacist Americans and their dupes are pushing an all-out drive to put rigid birth control measures into every black home. 
No such drive exists within the white American world. Black Unity Party, 1968. Birth control and sterilization in the wrong hands would be more deadly to Negroes than all the tanks, wired guns, cattle prods, billy clubs, and shackles we have overcome in the past. Dr. Leroy Swift, obstetrician, gynecologist, 1968. As it became clear that a growing number of African Americans were connecting the dots between birth control and black genocide, eugenics organizations began calling for the U.S. government to add birth control chemicals to the nation's food and water supply. It was even suggested that this strategy could be specifically targeted at urban neighborhoods. This idea was widely embraced in the eugenics movement and taken seriously enough by the government to be discussed at a 1969 meeting at the United Nations. Under the plan being considered, a couple could apply to the government for permission to have a child, and if approved, they would be given an antidote to the population control chemicals they had ingested in their food and water. Interestingly, the idea that government should have some sort of licensing agreement to regulate who would and would not be allowed to give birth was not a new one. In 1934, Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger had proposed that the U.S. government implement a system in which women would not have the legal right to have a child without a permit from the government and that these permits would only be good for one baby. But eventually, proposals like forced sterilization, chemicals in the food and water supply, and government control of childbearing were abandoned by most people in the eugenics movement. Despite the fact that many of them openly advocated such ideas, they would come to realize that there was really no practical way to carry them out. But for all their failures, what the eugenics movement had accomplished was to lay the foundation for the next phase of their plan. And this is where they would find the success that they had been chasing for over 100 years. What would you say is now the number one cause of death in the African American community? Heart disease. Oh, HIV AIDS. Uh, diabetes. Cancer. Uh, AIDS. I say heart disease. AIDS. From what I heard, it's probably AIDS, you know. Probably heart disease. Um, I think heart disease. Oh, uh, uh, HIV. No. Uh, gang violence. What if I told you the real answer was abortion? Since 1973, legal abortion has killed more African Americans than AIDS, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and violent crime combined. Every week, more blacks die in American abortion clinics than were killed in the entire Vietnam War. And the largest chain of abortion clinics in the United States is operated by Planned Parenthood. We have now reached a point in this country that African-American women, though they make up 12% of the population, they account for 37% of the abortions. An African-American baby is almost five times more likely to be aborted than a white child. The abortion industry at this point kills as many African-American people every four days as the Klan killed in 150 years. And you can truly say the most dangerous place for an African American to be is in the womb of their African American mother. All across America, you can stand outside of the abortion clinics and see a steady stream of black women coming in and out. But somewhere along the way, we got the idea that this is a white issue or a conservative issue or a Republican issue, and therefore, it's not an issue that we have to be concerned about. This same attitude has allowed Planned Parenthood and other members of the abortion industry to carry out this genocide right under our very noses. Right now, in America, 
about half of our babies are being killed in the womb. And in certain parts of America, more of our babies are being aborted than are being born. When 17,000 aborted babies were found in a dumpster outside of a pathology laboratory in Los Angeles, California, some 12 to 15,000 were observed to be black. Irma Clardy Craven, Chairman, Minneapolis Commission on Human Rights and Secretary of the Urban League. To understand what the agenda was behind the legalization of abortion, all you need to do is look at the statistics from the U.S. government. Studies from the CDC show that prior to the legalization of abortion, approximately 80% of all illegal abortions were done on white women. One study in New York even found that white women had five times as many abortions as black women. But at the moment abortion became legal, that began to reverse. And that's why the legalization of abortion was so crucial for the eugenics movement. Legalization created the ability to market abortion in the black community. And from a eugenics standpoint, that changed everything. These people cannot have it both ways. First, they say that birth control will reduce the number of abortions. Then they flood our neighborhoods with birth control clinics. And what's the result? Our abortion rate skyrockets. So either they lied about the fact that birth control would reduce abortions in our neighborhoods, or this is the results and the purpose they wanted from the beginning. At this point, I truly have the tendency to believe the latter. In 1973, the year abortion was legalized nationwide, Dr. Christopher Tietze produced a study on abortion demographics at the request of the Population Council, a New York-based eugenics organization. In this report, Tietze confirmed previous research showing that when abortion is illegal, the abortion rate is much higher for white women than for black women, but that this completely reverses whenever abortion is legalized. At the time he published these findings, Tietze was a consultant to both Planned Parenthood and the National Abortion Federation. Other researchers within the eugenics and abortion movements were also documenting that easy access to abortion clinics produces higher abortion rates in the surrounding area. And at least one expert discovered that having a nearby clinic is a bigger factor in the black abortion rate than it is in the white abortion rate. At the same time this data is being circulated, Planned Parenthood and the rest of the abortion lobby were in the process of locating the vast majority of their facilities in minority neighborhoods. Then in 1974, a study was released on population control that had been conducted by researchers at three major universities. By analyzing data obtained from Planned Parenthood's own records, they determined that the number one factor in deciding whether a county in the United States provided free or low-cost family planning services was not poverty, but race. The researchers said their findings seemed to support the contention of many civil rights activists that such programs are less intended to assist the poor than they are to control the growth of the black population. Birth control and abortion are turning out to be the great eugenic advances of our time. Frederick Osborne, founding member of the American Eugenics Society, 1973. The best way to hate a nigger is to hate him before he is born. Leander Perez, Louisiana State Judge, 1970. Two years after the director of Iowa Planned Parenthood had publicly attacked the state's eugenics board for not approving enough sterilizations, a bill was introduced in the Iowa legislature to legalize abortion. Despite having the support of both the state Republican Party and the state Democratic Party, as well as strong backing from the governor, the bill would be defeated almost single-handedly by the only African-American in the Iowa legislature. Proponents have argued this bill is for blacks and the poor who want abortions and can't afford one. This is the phoniest and most preposterous argument of all. I represent the inner city where the majority of blacks and poor live, and I challenge anyone here to show me a waiting line of either blacks or poor whites who are wanting an abortion. Iowa State Representative June Franklin, Democrat, 
1971. From the beginning, it was obvious that racism was the driving force behind the eugenics movement. While it was true that from time to time these elitist and social engineers would toss a few lower class whites in among the feeble minded and worthless who should be bred out of society, it was also true that they never seemed to include blacks among the best and the brightest who should be bred in. And at the same time, the country was being saturated with calls for population control and family planning. The facilities to carry them out were pouring into the black community. After all, no one was suggesting that there were too many white people in the world. And realities like those did not go unnoticed by early civil rights activists. For them, the reason birth control and abortion were being pushed was not a secret. Those whom we could not get rid of in the rice paddies of Vietnam we now propose to exterminate if necessary, eliminate if possible, in the OB wards and gynecology clinics of our urban hospitals. Jesse Jackson, 1971. Black people are the target of birth control, not because the ruling politicians like them and care about their economic equality, but because they hate them and can no longer use them in plantations and other cheap labor conditions. Muhammad Speaks, the Black Muslim Newspaper, 1970. I believe the entire question of abortions is just one more in the continuous series of events to eliminate the black population. Father George Clemens, Jet Magazine, 1973. The abortion law hides behind the guise of helping women, when in reality it will attempt to destroy our people. Brenda Heisen, New York chapter Black Panther Party, July 1970. The racist tells you to take birth control pills to kill, to murder life that might have existed if you had not. They are planning mass extermination of people they consider dispensable. Van Keys, Oakland Chapter, Black Panther Party, 1969. A true revolutionary cares about the people. He cares to the point that he is willing to put his life on the line to help the masses of poor and oppressed people. He would never think of killing his unborn child. Detroit Chapter, Black Panther Party, 1970. Who the hell is getting the pill? The Mexican and the Negro. Do you want to wipe us out? Cesar Chavez, 1967. On the day after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, a memorial service was held at Howard University in Washington, D.C. As mourners left the auditorium, they encountered about 600 people attending a rally outside. Several speakers were heard warning the crowd that population control was being used as a weapon of black genocide. Among the speakers who gave this warning was noted civil rights activist Stokely Carmichael. A year later, Pittsburgh police were called when 200 sticks of dynamite were discovered near a local Catholic church. An investigation revealed that the dynamite was not intended for the church, but was instead left behind by civil rights activist William Bowie Hayden. Hayden later admitted that he and his group, the United Movement for Progress, had planned to use the explosives to blow up nearby Planned Parenthood facilities because they were practicing black genocide. Hayden had once stated that any African American who supported allowing Planned Parenthood into black neighborhoods was an Uncle Tom. Into the black community stepped Planned Parenthood, only when they came into the black community, they've become planned black genocide. William Bowie Hayden, civil rights activist, 1971. Among those associated with Hayden was an African-American physician named Dr. Charles Greenlee. Greenlee had been a staunch supporter of Planned Parenthood, but became suspicious of the organization after noticing that black neighborhoods in his city were, as he described it, saturated with Planned Parenthood facilities, while nearby white neighborhoods that were just as poor did not have a single one. In an article published by the black Muslim newspaper, Mohammed Speaks, Greenlee said he had also discovered that deceptive materials were being circulated in the ghettos and delivered to the homes of black women, warning them that welfare recipients who had additional children would lose their public assistance. Greenlee knew that wasn't true and concluded that Planned Parenthood was pushing a hidden agenda. It was then he severed his ties to the organization and started working against it. The idea is to make less niggas so they won't have to build houses for them. 
If we keep producing, they're either going to have to kill us or grant us full citizenship. Dr. Charles Greenlee, civil rights activist, 1968. It is strange that they chose to start talking about population control at the same time that black people in America and people of color around the world are demanding their rightful place as human citizens and their rightful share of the material wealth in the world. Jesse Jackson, 1977. It is interesting how everyone assumes that the pro-life movement in America began in 1973 with Roe versus Wade. But we who were around during the civil rights movement and struggle of the 1960s, we know that the first anti-abortion groups were organizations like the Black Panthers, the Nation of Islam, and other community organizations. These folks were speaking out against both birth control and abortion long before the contemporary pro-life groups of today existed. But one of the problems with the civil rights movement was that there was far too many men and women who were willing to sell out the community. And a lot of powerful, influential African-Americans knew that they had to be willing to turn and look the other way in order to advance their own personal political agendas. In 1972, those members of the Congressional Black Caucus, such as Charles Diggs, did not trust the abortion industry or those who were espousing uh, population control or family health, and they were suspicious of them. But when the money began to flow, uh, just as it was with Jesse Jackson, when he found out that indeed he could get funding and monies to run for presidents from these people, uh, he flip-flopped in his position because he once said abortion is black genocide. What happens to a mind of a person in the moral fabric of a nation that can abort a baby without a pang of conscience? Where will we be 20 years from today? But when Reverend Jesse Jackson realized he needed money to run for president, all of a sudden the most important civil rights issue is a woman's right to choose. In 1975, Jesse Jackson called for the ban of abortion through a constitutional amendment. And in an interview in Jet Magazine, he referred to abortion as genocide. But Jesse Jackson, on the other hand, wanted to become president. And the Democratic Party at that time had sold out completely to Planned Parenthood and the eugenics crowd. And Jesse Jackson went along to get along. And don't ever think that he's the only one. The unfortunate thing we face, whether we're talking about individuals or organization, there's never been a shortage of black leaders who are willing to sell us down the river if it's enough money and political power in it for them. I've been grappling with the fact that the NAACP is in bed with the very organization that has brought black, geno black genocide to our community. Dr. Alveda King, the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King, has tried on at least three occasions to bring to this organization's attention the black genocidal plot of people like Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood to exterminate the black community. And the stonewalling has been astounding. Alveda King literally has gone to the street along with myself to say to the NAACP, please deal with this issue of black genocide. The NAACP has responded by hiding and trying to prevent their convention goers to hear about black genocide. They've even gone to the extent of using buses to block our demonstration about black genocide in front of Cobo Hall where the, their convention was going on. They have literally put black paper across their windows so that the convention goers at the NAACP convention could not see the demonstration going outside that included Alveda King. There is definitely a conspiratorial plot being hatched and has been hatched by the NAACP to keep from their people the fact that they are co-conspirators in the genocide of their own people. When you look at the number of African Americans who portrayed us over the years, it's not always clear whether they are uninformed or just out and out traitors. When we see pro-choice politicians defending abortion on television, do they really understand the implications of abortion and that it is certainly used for black genocide? Reverend Benjamin Hooks, one of the future former presidents of the NAACP, once personally told me that the NAACP would not bring this subject to the floor because it, but they believed it would tear up the NAACP. Even the media has conspired with the NAACP to keep this issue from the attention of the black community 
and the public at large. I have seen the news media literally hide their trucks so that they would not be in a position to have to cover the demonstrations in front of Cobo Hall, only to bring them out after the demonstrators had left. This is an outrage that the black community is having the life of its babies destroyed and the NAACP and the media are knowingly conspiring to keep this information from the public. This is an outrage and it should be dealt with by every fair-minded American. The civil rights elite has forgotten the lives of unborn black children and has joined those who choose to kill them. Unbelievable! They have forgotten that in the past Racists snatched black babies from their mother's arms and sold them into slavery. Today they snatch them from their mother's womb and throw them in the garbage. Ishmael Hernandez, Executive Director, African and Caribbean American Center, 2003. When we look at this issue of civil rights leaders who sell out, even when they clearly know that birth control and abortion are being used for black genocide, we need to understand that by the 1960s, population control, especially black population control, had become almost a religion for America's white power structure. And from the start, they made it clear that if you crossed them, or if you challenged their agenda, they would chop you off at the knees. And that remains true to this day. Whether you're talking about the liberal social engineers who control the Democratic Party, or the wealthy elitists who control the Republican Party, or the media, or the academic community, these people have created a kind of family planning cartel that does not tolerate dissent. And they have always been especially ruthless about this when it comes to African Americans. A perfect example of this was seen in the case of Samuel Yett. Mr. Yett was an award-winning journalist who had earned a master's degree from Indiana University, was a U.S. Air Force veteran of the Korean War, and served as special assistant for civil rights to the director of the U.S. Office of Economic Opportunity. He was also a professor of journalism at Howard University and a columnist for several magazines and newspapers. In 1968, Yet had become the first African-American reporter hired by Newsweek magazine and he quickly became their Washington, D.C. bureau correspondent. But then three years later, he wrote a book that exposed high-level plans within the United States to use birth control and abortion as instruments of black genocide. Then immediately after his book was released to the public, yet was called into his supervisor's office and fired. At that meeting, he was informed that his dismissal had been orchestrated by the Nixon White House. The next year, yet told the New York Times that pressure had been put on Newsweek to get him out of Washington. Then later, despite the fact that his book was selling well, had received at least two national awards and was being used as a textbook in over 100 colleges, Yet's publisher dropped him and the book went off the market. What's important to recognize about this situation and others like it was that this family planning cartel was sending a message to those who might have influence within the African American community, whether they were politicians or journalists or college professors or civil rights leaders. They were being warned that when it comes to population control, they only had two options. They could either get on board with it or they could keep their mouths shut. And when people like Samuel Yett told them what they could do with their two options, they paid a price that few others had the character or the courage to pay. The copyright to Samuel Yett's book was eventually given back to him. Then in 1982, Yet used his own money to republish it. The foreword of that edition was written by a well-known civil rights activist and co-founder of both the Harlem Writers Guild and the National Cultural Committee of the NAACP. His name was John Oliver Kellins and, in that foreword, he gave his analysis of the relationship between family planning and the black community. The American ruling class had made a hard decision. Americans of African descent would either accept their miserable lot or die. 
The venerable Saturday Evening Post issued what might be termed as a white paper in which it warned black America that they had better understand and accept the fact that absolute freedom and equality were not part of the game plan for them and that the consequence of non-acceptance would be wholesale genocide. John Oliver Killings, 1982. The minister's work is also important, and also he should be trained, perhaps by the Federation, as to our ideals and the goal that we hope to reach. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. In 1939, Margaret Sanger wrote that in a letter to fellow eugenicist Clarence Gamble regarding the American Birth Control League's Negro Project. Gamble was an heir to the Procter & Gamble fortune and a major financial backer of Sanger's. He also provided funding for other eugenics projects and even gave money directly to the North Carolina Eugenics Board that sterilized Elaine Riddick. In fact, in 1947, he called for the expansion of that state's sterilization program, saying that for every feeble-minded person sterilized, 40 more were polluting and degrading the bloodlines of future generations with their defective genes. Sanger's letter makes it clear that the eugenics movement understood they would need to neutralize the opposition they might get from the church. They also knew that this would be especially crucial within the African-American community. Their strategy was to manipulate church leadership into selling the illusion that support for eugenics was not inconsistent with the Christian faith. To do this, they would often recruit pastors to be front men for eugenics policies and provide them with prepackaged sermons on eugenics. They also held contests in which awards would be given to the ministers who came up with the best pro-eugenics sermons on their own. This approach proved so effective that an almost identical strategy would be adopted by the American abortion lobby. In January of 1973, the Supreme Court legalized abortion on demand throughout the United States. And almost immediately, the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights was formed. Less than a year earlier, the following conversation had taken place in the Oval Office of the White House. It began on the 30th of March, 1972, and continued four days later on the 3rd of April. This is an actual recording of that conversation. The speakers are the President of the United States, Republican Richard Nixon, and members of his senior staff. A majority of people in Colorado voted for abortion. I think a majority of people in Michigan voted for abortion. I think in both cases, both well, certainly in Michigan, they will vote for because they think the question of the abortion generally are the little black subjects. As I told you, we talked about it earlier, that a hell of a lot of people want to control the Negro bastard. Yeah. Isn't that very true? Yeah. So we don't know what we're talking about population control. Sure. We're talking really in what John Rockefeller really realizes. The, the people in what we call our class control their populations. Sometimes they'll have a family six or seven or eight or nine, but it's exceptional. Sure. The people who don't control their families are people and the people that shouldn't have kids. Now that's the black, the black population. Black population in the city of San Francisco has gone from 3,000 right after World War II to where they represent 30% of the population of San Francisco. That's it. The Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights was originally created with the financial backing of John Rockefeller, and its current president is an African American who was once appointed to the Washington, D.C. City Council by Richard Nixon. In the early 1990s, the organization changed its name and is today known as the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. In 1969, a meeting of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, also known as UNESCO, proposed that an American Population Commission be created with a, quote, large budget for propaganda, unquote. Four months later, Republican President Richard Nixon signed legislation establishing the Commission on Population Growth and the American Future. 
The bill authorizing this new initiative had been passed with overwhelming support from congressional Democrats and was chaired by John Rockefeller. The executive director of the project was to be Dr. Charles F. Westhoff, who was also a member of both the American Eugenics Society and Planned Parenthood's National Advisory Council. Another member of this new commission was Dr. Joseph Beasley. In the 1960s, Beasley oversaw an aggressive eugenics program that concentrated on black neighborhoods in New Orleans with the stated intention of lowering welfare costs. This project would eventually be described by Planned Parenthood President Alan Guttmacher as the number one success story in the history of American birth control movement. It also led to Beasley being elected chairman of the board of Planned Parenthood in 1970. Then in 1975, Beasley was sent to federal prison for conspiring to defraud the U.S. government of $778,000 that had been allocated for the project. In court, a local black civil rights activist named Sherman Copeland testified that he took payoffs from Beasley for helping him to convince residents of the targeted neighborhoods that birth control was not black genocide. In 1969, William H. Draper was appointed to represent the United States on the United Nations Population Commission. Draper had once proposed that government-sponsored population control efforts among the poor be accelerated in order to deal with racial unrest and to cure what he called the ghetto problem. Draper was on the governing body of Planned Parenthood and had personally raised more than $4 million for the organization. That same year, a New York Times article about Planned Parenthood said the organization's board of directors was dominated by people who were both white and wealthy. The article went on to quote one of those board members as saying, What it all comes down to is that we want the poor to stop breeding while we retain our freedom to have large families. It's strictly a class point of view. There's ample evidence that government programs designed for poor black folks emphasize birth control and abortion availability, both measures obviously designed to limit black population. Median Dick Gregory, Ebony Magazine, 1971. It takes little imagination to see that the unborn black baby is the real object of many abortionists. Irma Clardy Craven, Chairman, Minneapolis Commission on Human Rights and Secretary of the Urban League. It was not until the mid-60s that blacks began to realize that what was called urban renewal was in fact what one black city planner labeled Negro removal. Roy Ennis, National Director of the Congress of Racial Equality, Ebony Magazine, 1974. To a large and growing number of 1960s civil rights activists, it became obvious that family planning was just a code word for abortion and birth control, and that it was being pushed by the government as a way to avoid putting money into the black community. This conclusion was reinforced by statements like those of Democratic President Lyndon B. Johnson, who in June of 1965 stated that every five dollars the government spent on population control was worth more than a hundred dollars invested in economic growth. Then. At the urging of Republican Congressman George Bush, Johnson became the first U.S. president to endorse federal funding for birth control. In 1966, he would also accept Planned Parenthood's highest award for his policies, pushing family planning on foreign countries. It was at about this same time that political leaders from both parties began to increase their demands that aid to the poor, whether abroad or within the United States, be tied to birth control. In 1965, former Republican President Dwight Eisenhower complained that the United States was spending money to slow the population growth of responsible families, while at the same time providing financial incentives for ignorant, feeble-minded, and lazy people to have more babies. He said that history would rightly condemn the United States if we didn't link welfare to family planning. At that time, Eisenhower was the co-chairman of a Planned Parenthood fundraising campaign along with former Democratic President Harry S. Truman. John Ehrlichman, who was an assistant to President Richard Nixon, wrote that Nixon once told him that African Americans could not really benefit from federal programs because they are genetically inferior to whites. 
Later, Nixon would label birth control a national priority and sign legislation to make it available as a service of the U.S. government. Then, in March of 1972, the Commission on Population Growth and the American Future, which Nixon had created three years earlier with the help of congressional Democrats, began calling for the nationwide legalization of abortion. The concept that abortion and birth control could be used to save the government money was well established by this point in history. In 1969, Joseph Kershaw, who was a researcher with the U.S. government's Office of Economic Opportunity, stated that the agency had closely studied the poverty issue and found that the single most cost-effective way for the government to address it was through family planning. In other words, through abortion and birth control. And that sort of thinking is still very much alive today. On January 25, 2009, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, said on an ABC News program that the government's economic stimulus package should include a large increase in spending for population control. She said that this could save the state and federal governments the cost of having to pay for the health care and education of poor children. Not surprisingly, Pelosi has a 100% approval rating from Planned Parenthood. At one time, it was common to hear politicians and elected officials openly talking about the need for population control in the black community or saying things like uh, $1 spent on family planning is worth $5 spent on economic development. But since we don't hear that sort of thing anymore, it would be easy to conclude that the government is not still involved in black genocide, but that's not the case. Look, it's no longer necessary for the government to be directly involved in black genocide because that's what they hired Planned Parenthood for. I mean, it can't just be a coincidence that at the same time when government population control programs were backing away from specifically targeting black neighborhoods, at that same time, the state and federal funding for Planned Parenthood was being increased by leaps and bounds. To understand the magnitude of the dollars involved here, remember this. By 1970, Planned Parenthood was already the 19th largest health-related fundraising organization in the country. But by year 2000, it had moved into third place behind only the American Heart Association and the American Cancer Society. And a major factor in that phenomenal growth was government funding. Basically, what's happened over the last 40 years or so is that Planned Parenthood has taken billions in government money while locating the vast majority of its facilities in minority neighborhoods. And that has not only been a tremendous boost for the eugenics movement, but it has also allowed government-funded family planning programs to target the black population while insulating the government from any direct connection to black genocide. One of the places where government money has been used to advance the eugenics agenda has been in the public school system. Although government-funded population control programs can be found in white schools, the evidence is that they are significantly more likely to be targeted at black schools. One example of this was seen in 1986, when it was discovered that Illinois public schools were not only distributing birth control to children, but that every one of the 50 facilities involved were in minority neighborhoods. When this information was made public, a local African-American pastor organized a campaign to stop the program. Reverend Hiram Crawford labeled the project genocide, saying that the obvious goal was to go after the Hispanic and black population. That same pattern was also found in Maryland in the 1990s. Even though the state's teen pregnancy rate was higher among white students than black students, when the contraceptive device Norplant was introduced, it was selectively marketed to children as young as 13 in predominantly black schools in Baltimore. The result was that of the first 350 girls implanted at a local middle school, 345 were African American. Then, when Norplant was approved for general distribution, of the first 100 schools selected, all 100 were in minority neighborhoods. The Norplant contraception device was developed by the Population Council in New York, which had been established in 1952 under the leadership of its president, John Rockefeller. Its next two presidents, Frederick Osborne and Frank Notstein, 
were both former members of the American Eugenics Society. And Notstein would later serve on the National Advisory Council of Planned Parenthood. If you're going to curb population, it's extremely important not to have it done by the damn Yankees, but by the UN. Because the thing is, then it's not considered genocide. If the United States goes to the black man or the yellow man and says, slow down your reproductive rate, we're immediately suspected of having ulterior motives to keep the white man dominant in the world. If you can send in a colorful UN force, you've got much better leverage. Alan Guttmacher, president of Planned Parenthood and former vice president of the American Eugenics Society, 1970. Four years after Guttmacher made that statement, America's National Security Council issued a report that was intended to define the United States government's official policy on controlling world population. It was called the National Security Study Memorandum 200, or NSSM 200, and it was formulated in cooperation with the United States Agency for International Development, the U.S. State Department, the Department of Defense, and the Central Intelligence Agency. One of its goals was to establish a strategy for reducing the populations of third world countries so that the United States could have increased access to their natural resources, particularly minerals and metals. Among the conclusions of NSSM 200 was that no country has reduced its population growth without resorting to abortion. The authors of the report then identified three non-governmental agencies that would be funded to carry out the government's population control agenda in the targeted countries. One of those agencies was Planned Parenthood. One of the tactics specified in NSSM 200 was that we might withhold food aid after a disaster if the countries do not accept the American idea of birth control. And this has happened many times all over the world. One example is the uh, southern American country of Guyana, which was hit by a hurricane back in 1997. Now, they had turned down abortion and birth control for 12 years straight, but after the hurricane hit Guyana in 1997, the World Bank said, we will not give you any aid unless you legalize abortion and birth control, and that's exactly what they did. And we've seen this several times in Africa, where droughts have hit, and the United Nations and USAID will not assist unless they accept birth control. I've been all through Africa myself and I've seen medical clinics that are full of birth control devices but no safe motherhood delivery kits. There's no uh, anesthesia, there's not even any bandages there. There's crates and crates of birth control bills and condoms. Now while our commitment to birth control is going up every year, our commitment to authentic economic development is dropping. So we see less uh, clean drinking water funding, uh, less school funding, uh, see less medical clinic funding. Another example is Haiti. Uh, Haiti has been hit by hurricanes several times, and uh, the United States and other countries are saturated with birth control. In Haiti now, any woman, 90% of women at least, can now get access to any kind of birth control they want to, government funded, but less than 20% of the Haitians have access to clean drinking water. Now try to imagine there being a natural catastrophe in a country like Canada or Australia or France or England. And we go in there and we say to them, we're not gonna offer you any kind of aid unless you accept our philosophy on birth control and population control. That will be outrageous. But that's our standard operating procedure when we go to a black country after a catastrophe of some kind. You cannot believe that we are going to treat people in a foreign country like this and not treat our own population of African Americans the same way. Consider what happened after Hurricane Katrina. One of the first things we did was bring in birth control and contraception. And as we all know, the hurricane disproportionately affected black families in that area. And I seriously doubt if the same kind of disaster hit a middle-class white area, the first response would be condoms and birth control. This idea that population control could be used to control a specific population was not unique to NSSM 200. For example, before the Nazis took power in Germany, abortion had been illegal except to save the life of the mother. But under Hitler, the Hamburg Eugenics Court ruled that it would still be illegal for Aryan women, but legal for women of what they called inferior racial stock. According to the court, encouraging eugenic abortions would promote racial hygiene and protect the health of the German people. 
This new policy eventually led to certain women being threatened with execution if they refused to abort what the Nazis called racially worthless babies. At about the same time this was going on in Germany, the government of Bermuda was blanketing the island with population control facilities and openly stating that their intent was to limit the numbers of blacks. Then in 1958, blacks in the Caribbean rebelled against a Planned Parenthood-led birth control campaign that was exclusively targeted at non-white residents, while at the same time, prosperous white residents were being encouraged to multiply. Following a similar pattern, a 1965 article in the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper reported that under apartheid, the white South African government was relying on targeted birth control as its primary weapon to reduce the number of blacks in the country. Unfortunately, we now know that the U.S. government was not immune to this sort of thing either. When three pro-choice researchers investigated the original motive behind the creation of the abortion pill, RU486, what they discovered was that the scientific basis for it was actually developed in the United States during the 1960s by the National Institutes of Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In their 1991 book, these researchers claimed to have found data showing that this agency was looking for an inexpensive and effective drug to control the populations of foreign countries that the government had classified as underdeveloped. The abortion pill was to be tested in these environments and, if successful, the plan called for it to then be introduced into black, Hispanic, and Native American communities in the United States. In 1977, only three years after NSSM 200 was issued, the director of the United States Office of Population, Dr. Reimert T. Ravenholt, publicly stated that it was the U.S. government's intention to sterilize one-fourth of the world's female population. According to Ravenholt, one of the driving forces behind this campaign was the need to protect American financial and commercial interests. Ravenholt said that some foreign governments were refusing to give the United States permission to come into their country and control their population. He said that, in those cases, the plan was to be carried out by two private organizations with an enormous amount of financial support from the American government. When asked by a St. Louis newspaper to name the two organizations, he said that they were the United Nations Fund for Population Activities and Planned Parenthood. Among government officials who supported the Ravenholt philosophy of using American intervention to control the populations of foreign countries, perhaps the most powerful were Republican President Gerald Ford, Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. In the mid-1970s, while serving as foreign policy advisor to the Ford-Rockefeller administration, Kissinger personally helped Planned Parenthood set up an abortion counseling program for Vietnam refugees who were being housed at Camp Pendleton Marine Corps Base in California. This was done despite the fact that the vast majority of these refugees were known to be strongly opposed to abortion and not one of them had ever requested abortion counseling. At the same time, Kissinger also refused to hold an abortion training program that was being conducted by the Agency for International Development, which operates under the direction of the State Department. Kissinger allowed this project to continue despite numerous complaints that it was in clear violation of U.S. law that specifically prohibited American foreign aid funds from being used for this purpose. The commitment that Ford, Rockefeller, and Kissinger had for this illegal project may have been a reaction to something Reimart Ravenholt had said a few years earlier. In 1973, he was speaking at a Planned Parenthood national conference where he told attendees that abortion may actually be the most demographically powerful way of controlling population. Ravenholt would eventually be honored by Planned Parenthood for what it called innovation and vision in the population field. Years ago, a series of USA Today articles documented that there are large multinational corporations on the New York Stock Exchange today that actually got their start in the slave trade. But when slavery ended and Africans could no longer be financially exploited, many of those same corporations began pouring millions into the eugenics movement. The people they had found so valuable as property, they had little use for as fellow citizens. And again, some of those corporations and foundations and institutions 
are still around today, and every year they still pour millions into eugenics organizations like Planned Parenthood. In fact, if you look at Planned Parenthood's donor list, it reads like a who's who of corporate America. You also have individual elit elitists doing the exact same thing. People like Bill and Melinda Gates, Warren Buffett, Ted Turner, and many others have used their own personal fortunes to make sure that the eugenics movement never runs short of money. Of course, if you confront these people or these corporations about their support for organizations like Planned Parenthood, they'll tell you it has nothing to do with eugenics. And if someone is naive enough to believe that, that's fine. But to me, it's like someone saying, yeah, I'll give a few million dollars a year to the Klan, but I'm not really a racist. After the abortion pill RU486 was approved for sale in the U.S., the controversy surrounding it kept the abortion lobby from being able to find an American company to produce it. That forced them to look for a foreign manufacturer. And after an eight-year search, a company owned by the Chinese government agreed to manufacture the drug for the U.S. market. The company's management made the decision after the Rockefeller Foundation agreed to provide financial backing for the project. There's also another connection between Rockefeller and RU486. At the end of World War II, the German chemical manufacturer IG Farben was identified as the company that supplied the gas used in the Nazi concentration camps. The gas was called Zyklon B, and evidence later showed that Farben's executives knew how it was being used. In fact, evidence was uncovered to indicate that Farben engineers had actually designed the gas chambers. This led to some of them being tried at Nuremberg for crimes against humanity, including genocide and slavery. Interestingly, IG Farben was a financial partner with John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil of New Jersey in a company called Standard IG Farben. In addition, within three months after Hitler came to power, the publicity director of Rockefeller Foundation and personal advisor to John D. Rockefeller, a man named Ivy Ledbetter Lee, was assigned the responsibility of directing public relations for IG Farben. After the war, IG Farben would change its name to become known as Hercht AG. Today, Hercht is a gigantic multinational corporation with subsidiaries all over the world, including the United States. Ironically, one of Hercht's subsidiaries, Roussal Uclough, is the French company that developed RU486. In other words, the same company that produced the gas used in the Nazi death camps also produced the abortion pill that is now being used in American abortion clinics. And in both cases, there was a known connection to the Rockefeller Foundation. On the week he was inaugurated, Bill Clinton received this letter from attorney Ron Weddington. Weddington is the ex-husband of Sarah Weddington, the lawyer who successfully argued for the legalization of abortion in the Roe versus Wade case. 26 million food stamp recipients is more than the economy can stand. You can start immediately to eliminate the barely educated, unhealthy, and poor segment of our country. No, I'm not advocating some sort of mass extinction of these unfortunate people. Crime, drugs, and disease are already doing that. I am not proposing that you send federal agents armed with Depo Provera dart guns to the ghetto. You should use persuasion rather than coercion. Our survival depends upon our developing a population where everyone contributes. We don't need more cannon fodder. We don't need more parishioners. We don't need more cheap labor. We don't need more poor babies. Two days after being sworn in as president, Bill Clinton issued an executive order that allowed federally funded agencies to refer low-income women for abortions. He also directed that American dollars could be funneled to organizations that promote abortion in foreign countries. The Aid to Families with Dependent Children program is the worst boondoggle ever created. When a sullen black woman of 17 or 18 can decide to have a baby and get welfare and food stamps and become a burden to us all, it's time to stop. Dr. Edward Allred, abortionist, 1980. Edward Allred is the owner of one of the largest chains of abortion clinics in the United States. Not long before Allred made this statement, 
The Los Angeles Times had reported that his California facilities were handling referrals made by Planned Parenthood. Even as late as the 1960s, the wealthy elite who made up the eugenics movement never tried to hide the fact that their agenda was driven by financial considerations as much as it was driven by the desire to create racial purity. A good example of this was seen in 1967 when eugenicist and Nobel Prize winner Dr. William Shockley caused a national uproar when he stated that it was a waste of taxpayer money to create better schools and welfare programs for what he called ghetto Negroes. He claimed to have research showing that people of African descent are genetically inferior to whites in intelligence and simply not smart enough to take advantage of programs designed to help them. To save taxpayer money, he proposed that the U.S. government implement forced birth control to lower the reproduction of the inferior classes and then issue certificates to become pregnant that would be sold on the New York Stock Exchange. Shockley was a National Committee member of Planned Parenthood and a featured speaker at at least one Planned Parenthood conference. When Florida abortion clinic owner Joyce Tarno appeared on a local talk show, she gave the following reply when asked what America should do to help impoverished nations that are facing starvation or other natural disasters. Time is running out for us. In 1968, Dr. Paul Ehrlich wrote The Population Bomb. And in that book, he stated uh, a thesis that what we should be doing is helping those nations that have a reasonable chance of being able to produce their own food supplies. Those that cannot do that for whatever reason, those people have to just sink or swim on their own. And what we do is try to help those societies become self-sustaining that have a chance to learn how to fish in order to feed themselves. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you ad well, wait a minute. Right, I just want to make sure this is clear. Are you advocating, or was he advocating basically writing off yes. people that uh, have no hope of ever because of yes. the climate or whatever problems of yes. feeding themselves? Yes. Sort of like survival of the fittest? Or? Right. And the thing you, is... Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. The more people you help to survive, the more people are going to be reproducing and having children beyond what we can reasonably hope to have so that we can educate and house and feed these people. When Joyce Tarno retired in 2004, she told a local newspaper that she had tried to get as many people sterilized as are in my way. She also restated her views on foreign aid, saying that the United States should help those countries that can prosper but let the others wither on the vine. Citing Haiti as an example, Tarno said that the Haitian people should be made to stew in their own juices because they had destroyed their environment. In order to really understand the role money plays in the eugenics movement, it is important to keep in mind that its original mission was not to make a profit, but to eliminate a group of people that the elite saw as a financial burden because of things like welfare, crime, taxes, and so forth. And when you look at the wealthy individuals and corporations that fund the modern eugenics movement, you see that this has not really changed. You also see that these people are willing to pay out big money to those who can carry out their agenda. And when Planned Parenthood figured this out, they volunteered for the job. The result is that money has been poured into this organization to the point that Planned Parenthood is now a billion dollar multinational corporation that operates the largest chain of abortion clinics and birth control facilities in America. While much of Planned Parenthood's financial success has been because of donations from these wealthy individuals and large corporations, it has also raked in billions from you and me. In 2006 alone, despite having made over $60 million in profit, Planned Parenthood received about $350 million from the U.S. government. And in 2009, Planned Parenthood will receive approximately $1 million every single day from the American taxpayer. That's $1 million every 24 hours. That comes directly out of your paycheck and mine. Now, what you may find interesting is how your money is being spent. To give you just one example, we're going to show you part of a website that Planned Parenthood launched in 2008 called TakeCareDownThere.com. The clip is titled, I Didn't Spew. And I warn you, many of you are going to find it highly offensive, and you're going to find it especially inappropriate for children, despite the fact that is exactly who Planned Parenthood created it for. As you watch this piece, remember, you helped pay for it. Whoa, guy, 
Where's the prophylactic? What do you mean? Look, oral sex is still sex, okay? If it's unprotected, you gotta reject it. What? What? But I didn't even spew. Guys, guys, doesn't matter. Look, if you're having sex or you're getting some blowjays or whatever, you need to use a condom. Because you could catch a sexually transmitted infection. Even if you don't spew. Now, does this clip say anything about how Planned Parenthood sees African Americans? You'll have to judge that for yourself. But there's no doubt that if this same video had been made by a bunch of white supremacists or the Ku Klux Klan or some neo-Nazi group, we would all understand the symbolic message behind it. In 2007, live action films of California conducted an undercover investigation of Planned Parenthood offices in several states. Under the direction of the organization's president, Lila Rose, the goal of the project was to determine whether Planned Parenthood officials would accept financial donations on the condition that the money would only be used to eliminate African Americans. The following clips are from the actual recordings of those conversations. When I underwrite abortion, does that apply to minorities too? If you specifically want it to underwrite an abortion for a minority person, you can target it that way. You can you can specify that that's how you want it spent. Okay, yeah, because there's so I de there's definitely way too many black people in Ohio. So I'm just trying to do my part. Okay, whatever. Well, blacks especially need abortions too. So that's what I'm trying to do. Well, for whatever reason, we'll accept the money. So. So the abortion could could be, you know, I could give money specifically for a, a black baby. That would that be the purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you wanted to designate that you wanted your gift to be used to help an African American woman in need, mm -hmm. um, then we would certainly uh, make sure that that gift was earmarked specifically for that purpose. Great, because because I really face trouble with affirmative action, and I don't want my kids being disadvantaged, you know, against um, black kids. I just had a baby. I want to put it in his name, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know so that's that's definitely yeah. possible. Oh, always, always. So could, would it be possible for me to, to donate that money specifically for these these minority groups so that they could have access to abortions? Yes, it would be. Wonderful. And could I specify that abortion be done, or those abortions be done for a particular minority group, or how does that work? If you wish, you can. Okay. So, so for example, the black community in Tulsa, because I have connections with that, would it be possible to, to give the money specifically for that? You sure can. Wonderful. Great. Uh, so can I give you my credit card number? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, j just one more thing. The, the, abortion, the, the abortions will be done specifically for, for uh, uh, black community abortions. I can, I will mark it in such a way that definitely it will. Oh, great. On a black baby. Yes. Thank you. Great. The exact amount we charge right now is $450 for an abortion. Okay, $450. Mm-hmm. And um, we can definitely designate it for an African American. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Um, okay, and if I want to make, um, to fund, because, you know, this is, this is a, um, if I wanted to help fund multiple, um, Abortions, could you also specify that this could be done for um, a specific group? Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm really excited, you know, because I really face trouble with affirmative action. I don't want my kids to be um, uh, disadvantaged, um, you know, yeah. against against um, against blacks with, in college. And, you know, the less, um, less blacks out there, the better, so. Yeah, yeah, it's a strange time, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So... Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jeremy. And if you have any questions, please feel free to give me a call. My extension is 304. When this material was released to the public, Planned Parenthood's defense was to claim that the employees who made these statements were not reflecting the organization's corporate position. But in 1986, Planned Parenthood's national president, Faye Waddleton, made the following statement during an interview on CNN. As a matter of fact, Mr. Dorn, and if I may finish, we have received contributions from people who want us, who want to support us because they want all welfare mothers and all black women to stop having children. 
What Ms. Waddleton was conceding in this CNN interview and what live action films found in their undercover investigation was acknowledged years before by a previous Planned Parenthood president. During a speech in Philadelphia in January 1966, Planned Parenthood president Alan Guttmacher stated that some of his colleagues appeared to have racial motives for their involvement with the organization. Not surprisingly, one of Guttmacher's acquaintances later warned him that in the future, he should not be making comments like that in public. The person who gave that warning obviously understood that Planned Parenthood's racial agendas and attitudes are best kept out of the public. And that has been a philosophy that Planned Parenthood has embraced for many years. This idea that man could reinvent the world through eugenics was an elitist philosophy espoused by those who considered themselves to be not only financially superior, but intellectually superior to everyone else. And Planned Parenthood became the golden child of these people because Planned Parenthood is the one who figured out how to make eugenics work. They figured out that the key to racial genocide is not in killing people, but in convincing the target group to commit mass suicide. This is what birth control and especially abortion are all about. And the reason Planned Parenthood has been so successful is because unlike other eugenics organizations, they have always been able to keep their agenda hidden from the public. In fact, sometimes they are even able to hide it from their own people. I will assure you that there are Planned Parenthood employees and volunteers all over this country who have no idea what they're actually involved in. Then there are other people who will look you right in the face and tell you that racism was not the driving force behind the American eugenics movement. And I think you'd have to be a complete idiot to believe that. The truth is that if blacks had never been stolen out of Africa and brought here in chains, there would never have been a eugenics movement in the first place. There would never have been forced sterilizations. There would never have been a birth control revolution. There would never have been a call for the legalization of abortion. And you would have never heard the terms population control and family planning. The fact is that had slavery never existed, Planned Parenthood would not exist today. We need to remember that over 60 years ago, a man who could today be called the father of modern day eugenics proposed that population control clinics be concentrated in minority neighborhoods. And now today, the vast majority of Planned Parenthood clinics are located in our neighborhoods. Are we really so naive to believe that this is all a coincidence? We all know that drugs, alcohol and tobacco are devastating, especially in the black community. We know that the big corporations target us with the ads and the marketing campaigns. And yet, we don't notice that Planned Parenthood is doing the very same thing. We need to pay attention to the fact that in the 1960s, when we as African Americans began to demand our civil rights, for the first time in American history, there began a widespread cry in our government for legalized abortion. Was that coincidence too? Or could it be that when we said we would no longer sit on the back of the bus, a place was being reserved for us down at the abortion clinic? For most people, it may be hard to conceive that the ethnic cleansing going on today through legal abortion began with the fear of freed slaves. But as you have seen, that is exactly what happened. When colonization failed, Charles Darwin and Francis Galton were there to tell the world that people of African descent were just one small step above the ape. And white elitists embraced that philosophy, not because they had studied it and found it to be true, but because it gave them the permission they needed to wipe us out. And that launched a chain of events that quickly took on a life of its own. Every time one eugenic strategy failed, another was invented to take its place. It was a pattern that would be continued from one generation to the next until they finally discovered the strategy that worked. You know, when you study the Nazi Holocaust, 
You can see these films of Jews running into ditches to be shot in the head. You can even see films of them actually walking into the gas chambers. And it's tempting to ask yourself why they didn't fight back. I mean, if you're going to be killed anyway, what do you have to lose? Perhaps the answer is that they simply could not believe it was really happening. Maybe the normal human mind is just not wired to accept that your fellow man is capable of such senseless brutality on such a scale, even when you see it happening with your own eyes. As African Americans, we need to recognize that we are doing the same thing. We need to understand that terms like pro-choice and reproductive rights and family planning are nothing more than marketing slogans. They're just code words that organizations like Planned Parenthood use to hide the fact that we're voluntarily submitting to the will of those who have been trying to exterminate us since the day slavery ended. At the beginning of this program, we told you that the Ma'afa didn't end with the freeing of the slaves, and that in fact, it hasn't ended yet. Now you've seen the rest of the story. Now you know that legalized abortion is more than just a crime against humanity. It is also the continuation of a 150-year-old racial agenda that was founded in black genocide. And I hope that you have also come to see that as long as abortion remains legal, the Ma'afa cannot end. Thanks for watching. Brothers and sisters, it is time. Brothers and sisters, it's time for us to go to the streets on this issue. Yes, we need to be in the streets on this issue. Yes, if we look the other way, mm -hmm. while our smallest brothers and sisters are being lynched in the room, mm -hmm. we lose the right to be outraged Come on. that we were once lynched mm -hmm. by the Klan. Right. When white supremacist Tom Messer tells his followers to invest their money in ghetto abortion clinics, he's not talking about reproductive rights. Mm -mm. He's talking about reproductive racism. Yes, he is. Oh, when two guys write a book mm -hmm. talking about Steve Levette, mm -hmm. John Donahue, mm -hmm. when two guys, Steve Levette, John Donahue, write a book in which they claim that the high rate of abortion mm -hmm. keeps the rate of crime down. Mm -hmm. Lord, Be assured, mm -hmm. they know that a vast majority of American abortion clinics are in black neighborhoods. Oh, yes, they yeah. oh, yes, they Come on. They know they're in the minority neighborhoods. What we need to understand is when we let Planned Parenthood into our schools, when Planned Parenthood put their death camps, when we let them put their death camps in black communities, mm -hmm. in our communities, right. and when we sit back and let an elected government official mm -hmm. take money out of our paycheck to pay Planned Parenthood, mm -hmm. we have been played like fools. Oh, yes, we have. Jesus. The fact is, if we tolerate something as evil as abortion, mm -hmm. we cannot be surprised if it turns around and is used against us. Mm -hmm. well, we can't be surprised if it's turned around and used against us. We can't be angry if it's turned around and used against us. Man. Notice for sure, as long as abortion is legal, mm -hmm. in America we will never be able to stop it being used to commit black genocide. That's right. Amen. We'll never be able to use it as a weapon for what I call the mafia. Mm. The fact is, if we tolerate something as evil as abortion, we cannot be surprised angry when it's turned against us. Mm -hmm. Say it that one, Dinner. You know it's easy, to, it, well, you know it was easy to spot the enemy when he was a redneck, mm -hmm. well, toothless redneck, uh -huh. probably spent about three years trying to get past the fourth grade. Uh -huh. well. <laughs> but today, our enemy don't wear white hoods. Oh, no, they don't. Today our enemies wear a white lab coat yes. Well, yes, with a thestoscope around his neck. Yes. Yes. Well. Mm -hmm. And what gets really aggravating sometimes, mm -hmm. like a pimp, mm -hmm. sometimes he's black. Come on. Oh, man. 
And this is not about political parties either, because there's a reason I'm an independent. Mm -hmm. Both the Republican Party and Democratic Party have been in bed with Jezebel Come on. Well, and the eugenics business for more years than you and I have been alive. Come on. That's right. That's right. I will also tell you this. Every time we vote for politicians mm -hmm. who tell us they are pro-choice, mm -hmm. it's like we're spitting on the graves of our ancestors. Our ancestors did not break the chains of slavery. No, they, did. they didn't escape the plantations and the cotton field mm -hmm. just so we could actually then take power and give it to political people who were there to wipe us out. We need to remember mm -hmm. Come on now. why there were civil rights groups. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes sir that fought against abortion in the 60s. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to understand what it was that Harold Crawford and Irma Carver and Craven was talking about long before abortion became legal in this nation when they stood up and they know that there's a real connection between poverty, mm -hmm. abortion, and genocide. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. They understood it. Oh, yes, they did. Amen. Folks, You know, it's time we looked at what's been done to our children. Mm. Come on out there. I had the privilege of meeting Mamie Till in Chicago years ago. Yes. She complimented us on what we were doing. Yes. And my heart was really moved sitting next to her and having this lady look me in the eye and tell me that. Because you remember Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember what happened. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Yes. When he was beaten and bludgeoned yes. so bad yes. Yes, yes. that most of the time people said, well, there's got to be a closed casket. His mother decided, no, no, no. She demanded an open casket because yes. she wanted the world to see yes. what they had done to her baby. That's right. Amen. That's right. And it's time we now look and not look away and look what has been done to our children in the womb. Yes, yes, yes. It's womb lynching. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Come on now. now the point is not that killing a black child is worse than killing a white child. It's not. Regardless of the victim's skin color, eye color, or hair color. Legalized abortion is a crime against all humanity. Amen. Amen. Every right. one of us. But it's also, it's like a loaded gun mm -hmm. aimed right between our eyes. And every time we walk into a voting booth, and we help elect the politician who says he's pro choice. By pulling that lever, every time we pull that lever for a pro trouble, we pull the trigger on that loaded gun. Jesus. Come on, man. And a child dies. Amen. Come on now. That's true regardless of what party they're in. That's right. Amen. That's true regardless of what office they are running. That's right. Amen. You and I know there's a lot of pro-choice politicians. They will concede. They'll say, oh, well, yes, we know that abortion is, is the taking of a human life. They, they'll, they'll, know, they'll admit that. And then they'll turn around and write, write around and say, but it should be legal. Yeah. Well. Mm -hmm. And I have to wonder, mm -hmm. why? No, in fact, I don't have to remember why. I just wonder how many. Come on. Of these politicians mm -hmm. who know that abortion is mass murder, mm -hmm. tolerate it because they think the right people are being murdered. Mm. Well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know the answer to answer that question. But I, and, 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 but, but I do know this. I know that if the Klan, with or without their hoods, Come on 
were to open up a whole chain of abortion clinics right, right. Uh -huh. and they were to concentrate them in the black communities, right. we would be smart enough to know what's going down. Yes. Amen. 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 But I'm telling y'all something, brothers and sisters. We shouldn't be smart enough to know what's going down now yes. when Planned Parenthood yes. and these other abortion businesses do the same thing. Yes. The time has come for us to wake up. The time has come for us to realize that we, our people, are no longer being illegally lynched one or two at a time at the end of a dirt road. It's time for us to realize that our people are being womb lynched. It is time to realize they are being legally Stripped to shreds by millions in air-conditioned rooms with sweet, soft elevator music playing in the background. It is time for us to realize that we are in a war. We are in a war that if we don't become involved and we try to look the other way, it's going to wipe us out. It's called black genocide. It's time that we realize we have found the weapon of mass destruction, and the weapon of mass destruction is the suction machine in Planned Parenthood. Knowing what we know now, we can no longer look the other way. To end this mouth in the 21st century, we as a people will have to do something. To do nothing is not an option. The only question left to answer is, what are we going to do about it?